I'm the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Egypt-Japan University of Science and Technology and senior consultant for the National Telecommunications Institute. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all to uh, this session on urban and rural development, sustainability for all. As you know, by time, more and more immigrants are moving into cities, which uh, causes problems for both. Cities are really under heavy burden of the heavy traffic and the emergence of some slum areas. <coughs> and the uh, increase of population of high-rise buildings, which affects the quality of life of urban areas. At the same time, rural areas are also suffering from a lot of services that are needed for rural areas. So both of them need attention, and that is the subject matter of uh, this session. Without any further delay, I'd like to uh, introduce our first uh, speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Kanayun Wanzi, and he is the uh, president of the International Fund for Agriculture Development, IFAD. He has been in this position since 1st of April, 2009. And before, he, he, he has been the vice president of the same organization for two years. Professor Nuanzi has been always active on the agriculture research, especially in Africa and Asia, and he was instrumental in the establishment of the Alliance of the uh, Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research in Africa. Dr. Nwanzi uh, earned his bachelor degree in agricultural science from the University of uh, Ibadan in Nigeria, 1971, and he got his doctoral degree from uh, the Kansas State University in the United States in agricultural uh, entomology. Please join me to welcome uh, Professor Kanayu Nwanzi. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Distinguished colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would first uh, like to thank uh, Dr. Ishmael Sarah Geldin, Director of the Biblioteca Alexandrina, for organizing this important conference and for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to learn as well as to share experiences and ideas. I'm delighted to be back here in Egypt, at the breadbasket of the ancient world, and in this spot of ancient learning. Over several millennia, Egypt has given the world so much and yet, in many ways, the nation today seems younger than it did just two years ago. As a former research scientist, it is always a pleasure to spend time among the, uh, the company of uh, fellow scientists. There is, of course, a direct and strong link between investment in research and the elimination of poverty and hunger. Uh, as a scientist, I've always tended to base my conclusions on solid evidence. So I would like to share, first of all, some numbers with you from the International Food Policy Research Institute, uh, IFPRI. The tendency in these uh, sessions uh, conferences is for us to give a lot of data and statistics and to say how bad things are and uh, hypothesize about what we could do. I would like to change that around today and while identifying what the issues are, I would like to also offer examples of solutions that we at my institution, IFAD, 
have supported over the years. Uh, in China, one person was lifted out of poverty for every $109 that was spent on agricultural research. And in Uganda, the impact of research was even more dramatic. One person lifted from poverty for every $16 that was spent on research. Uh, a separate report from the CGIR, the Consultative Group on Agricultural Research, International Agricultural Research, indicates that for every dollar spent on ag research produces $9 worth of added food in developing countries. One dollar generates $9 worth of added food. Science and technology are the foundation of agricultural development because they do generate pro-poor technologies. For those of you who are familiar with the quality protein maze, QPM, this was generated as a result of research. It's now widely used by farmers and is reducing malnutrition among adults and babies in developing countries. It was also research that generated high yielding cassava varieties in West Africa. And I'm proud to mention this example because I had a hand in it some 40 years ago. That tells you how young I am. That research led to the elimination of the cassava millibug through an Africa-wide biological control program. As a result of this IFAD-funded research program, at least 20 million lives were saved in the cassava belt of Africa. And it cost 2.2, and it generated 2.2 million in production. Now the total cost of this program was just $20 million. So in other words, for every dollar that was invested in this program, one life was saved. Our theme for today's discussion is on sustainability. Sustainability for all. It sounds like a lofty goal, but I can tell you that sustainability is within our reach in this generation. I know it from my 20 years in the CGIR, uh, 10 years uh, on top of that in managing an institution, one of the CGIR centers, Africa Rice, now based in Cotonou, and then five years since I have been with IFAD. There are three pillars to the sustainable development agenda, economic, environmental, and social. And smallholder small agriculture is central to all of these three elements. Now, when development is sustainable, the, benefits, the benefit lasts through the years. It is development that respects and responds to local conditions, whether, whether cultural or environmental so that the changes are able to take root and continue even when aid workers may have left. We have seen all too often the aftermath of what happens. Broken tractors, abandoned fields, withered untended trees are forsaken. In Mauritania, IFAD is working with smallholders to promote sustainable solutions to combat desertification and mitigate impact of, uh, of a plant, Prosopis juliflora, an, invas an invasive tree. This tree was introduced to protect oases from sand encroachment, but is crowding out the local palm trees and depleting groundwater. These examples of good intentions gone bad are the results of interventions that did not take into consideration the sociology or the psychology of local populations. Now, as scientists and researchers, we tend to focus on biological and physical experiences. But in my years of working in development, I have learned that science has the greatest impact when it is combined with understanding the softer sciences. In order for science to truly improve the conditions of poor rural people, Scientists must understand the environment where their discoveries will be used. In other words, we want our work to be sustainable. We must apply the same rigor of thought to understanding the social dimension 
of local communities and the ecological dimension of local landscapes. At IFAD, we see time and again the transformation that occurs when development is sustainable and when local people themselves are involved right from the start. Last year, I visited a village in Burkina Faso, Zongbega, where smallholders are using simple water harvesting techniques, such as planting pits and permeable rock dams. As a result, they have restored land that was once degraded and increased their productivity. In Niger, a water harvesting project in Ilela department is still going on 15 years after the project ended. The project itself encouraged farmers to continue the practice. The pits are dug before the rains and they collect and store rain water and runoff. The half moons, or the milun as they call them there, are simple earth embankments in the shape of semicircle. The project, as I said, ended in 1996. But we returned to the area in January this year. It showed that farmers are continuing to make pits and half moons. And these, there, is considerable, there is considerable anecdotal evidence that the water harvesting techniques are reaching the groundwater. In the village of Batodi, the water level in wells increased by 14 meters, 14 meters between 1994 and 2004. The increase is unlikely to be only the result of rainwater, because in 2004 or 2011, those were drought years. So the simple adoption of water harvesting techniques forces rainfall and runoff to infiltrate, and it locally recharges the groundwater. Now, 20 years ago, the fields around the village of Batodi were completely barren. Today, they have high, higher on-farm tree densities, which helps to keep the soil fertile and provides fodder for livestock. As you can see from these three examples and the film that I'm, I'm going to show you later, it is not always the most advanced technology that reaps the greatest rewards. Sometimes the best way to grow food in an arid climate is to go back to basics, building a rock dam to stabilize soil and collect water runoff, or to construct cisterns to collect rainwater. This is particularly true in areas of Africa's dry lands, where the soils are inherently poor. It is vital for us to increase soil organic matter content, which determines whether inorganic fertilizers can be used but also leads to more infiltration of rainwater. Not only does rural development contribute to food security, it can help to stop the flood of immigrants to cities, just as the chairman referred to earlier, and provides career opportunities for young people. To answer the question of what is happening in the often neglected left behind countryside, I'd like to show you a short film in the, from the village, village in northern Mali. A year ago, this young Malian, Diallo Haroun, returned home from the Ivory Coast. He lives in the village of Gorma Rarus in the desert just south of the River Niger. People here are farmers, but in recent years, drought and conflict have resulted in reduced harvests and a mass exodus, and not just in Gorma Rarus. Until recently, most of northern Mali's young people were migrating to cities and neighboring countries, such as the Ivory Coast, Niger and Ghana which has had a devastating impact on communities here, leaving villages and towns like Diallo's populated largely by children and the elderly. But now Diallo has come back because he has hope for a future here, something desperately needed for the country, says a local representative from the Ministry of Agriculture. We all know youth is the future of a country. If they are unemployed, they're always at risk of drifting and of creating problems. 
So to try and occupy these youths, to try to find work for these youngsters, is one of the most important things for a country. Shortly after returning to Mali, Diallo heard about a government project created to do just that. Supported by the UN's International Fund for Agricultural Development, the project offers training and work opportunities to local youth. Diallo bought a motor pump and was helped to develop a small business growing fodder, which he stores and sells to his neighbors. I've managed to feed our animals, and we can put some to one side in a storehouse. Then, at a certain time, I sell it. So with that money, I can cover all our needs. For many young people here, the chance to earn a living is reason enough to come home and stay. Five years ago, nearly all of these young people would have left. This young man, Hama Agisa, is another returnee. He was recently trained as a builder during the project's construction of a new irrigation system, which links the river Niger to his village. The impact for me, as head of a family with children, is that now I have animals, a house, and work tools. So for me, I'd have to say it is going well. And as more young people find employment, the local economy also benefits. But in the end, it's the presence of the young people themselves that spells hope for Mali's future. Well, thank you. As you can see, creating economic opportunities in rural areas can lead to reverse migration. We have seen this in many of our projects. As the film makes clear, young people are the lifeblood of their communities. About 90% of today's young people are born in developing countries where around half of the total population lives in rural areas. In the last session, Dr. Sarah Geldane said that 50% of the population, uh, of, of the Egyptian population is less than 30 years old. In Burundi, where I was a few, day, a few, year, a few, a few weeks ago, 60% of the population is younger than 25 years, and 90% of them live in rural areas. Now, with these young people who are forced to leave their homes to search for work, with their villages, their villages begin to die. But when they can make a good living at home, their energy and creativity can be channeled into reviving their villages. We need the young people of today to become the farmers of tomorrow. Just to feed themselves? No, but also to feed their villages and to grow the food to feed growing populations. After all, farming is a rural activity. So we need to have vibrant rural areas to ensure a dynamic flow of economic benefits between rural and urban areas. Investing in young people, rural young people, is, is, is a simple but elegant solution to some of the world's pressing problems. It helps to eliminate poverty and hunger. It curtails migration to cities and abroad. And it lays a solid foundation for national, regional, and global security. It is unfortunate that we have recently had to suspend our work in, north, in the north of Mali, where the project is based. But the current situation in Mali underscores the absolutely crucial need to create steady, reliable, and reasonably paid work for young people in rural areas. Rural communities offer young people a range of income-generating opportunities to choose from. In extreme situations, they oftentimes are the ones that sustain the society. But in order for rural development to take root and hold, we cannot look at issues in isolation. There is no point in asking a farmer to increase yield if the farmer doesn't have storage facilities to, to store its surplus, or if there is no demand for its produce. There is no point in increasing yields if the infrastructure does not exist for farmers to be able to take their produce to market. As scientists, when we look at how best to support smallholder farmers, we must not only improve the ability to grow more food, 
We must strengthen the ability to participate in markets while improving the way those markets function. We must ensure that there is sufficient investment in rural infrastructure with paved roads, electricity supply, and running water, adequate transportation and storage facilities. And we must ensure a space and a role for the private sector. African governments must learn to, must learn to create the enabling environment for the private sector to invest. Not only large companies, but also small farmers and organizations and the domestic rural, rural private sector. One, more than one third of the rural population in Africa lives five, five hours from the nearest market town, making it totally unacceptable and impossible to transport their produce. If a farmer cannot market his, his, his produce or has surplus, there is no logical reason to produce more she will only produce what her family can consume because surplus production doesn't get to market. It gets spoiled in storage. I say she because women are often the farmers in the developing world. But unfortunately, women are also usually the most disadvantaged members of rural societies without access to land or to financial services. Yet we know when women are empowered and they have access, we can reduce the number of hungry people in the world by 100 to 150 million people. For studies have shown conclusively that when women earn money, they are more likely than men to spend it on food and for their family. Young women and men hold the key to ensuring food and nutrition security. When you consider the fact that the developing world would have to double food production by 2050 in order to meet projected demand, you can see that it is imperative for us to create vibrant rural communities where their economies are attractive for young people to invest. In addition to improving rural economies, we must change the perception of farming so that young people will stop trying to escape the farm and look for something more attractive elsewhere. We must make farming as attractive as high tech in fashion or industry. This means we must see farming as a dignified occupation. It's a wage generating work as good as any other business. Agriculture is an economic income generating activity. It's a business. It is not just the end of the road for poor rural people. And we must consider the impact of our work on the physical environment. Agricultural research successfully, successfully drove the Green Revolution in Asia. But we knew decades later the damage it has caused to the environment. In the years since the Asian Green Revolution, we have also become aware of climate change and its impact on agriculture and smallholders. But, it, but, it, but, it, but the discussions on climate change are taking place in Washington, in London, in Paris, in Geneva, and Copenhagen. Small farmers are often neglected. And that is why at IFAD, we are putting together a new initiative Adaptation for Smallholder Agriculture Program, or ASAP, where we will help to channel resources, financial resources, for climate smart, sustainable investments in poor smallholder communities. It has become clear that agricultural growth must be ecological sustainable, and that a diverse range of species, genetic variation, and ecosystems is necessary in order for the land to provide for future generations. We must have as many tools at our disposal, also including biotechnology. But we must recognize, however, that biotechnology is not the end all and be all of everything. It's only a tool, and it cannot be an end in itself. Let us look at the situation in Africa. If we can optimize the potential that Africa has, 
in terms of the use of its natural resources. Imagine that in Africa, only 6% of cultivated land is irrigated, compared to 40% in Asia. If we only could increase irrigation, we can double outputs in Africa. Fertilizer use in Africa is woeful. About 10 to 13 kilograms of fertilizer is applied per, per hectare is applied in agricultural production in Africa. This compares to about 80 kilograms in the Middle East and North Africa, and about 200 kilograms in Asia and the Pacific. Now you can imagine what we could do. These challenges are opportunities because nowhere else in the world can you just double your inputs and you can triple yield. Our challenge is to take what we know works, to develop what we know is needed, and to apply the knowledge country by country, region by region, throughout the developing world. And that is what we call scaling up. As I advocate for more investment in research, let me be clear. Research for the sake of research is wasteful and pointless. Research ultimately needs to have an application. It is our job to ensure that science and technology contribute to the improvement of rural areas. It's our job as responsible scientists to ensure that our work contributes to nurturing and preserving ecosystems. Agricultural research can ensure that the smallholder, the fisherman, the fisherwoman, the pastoralist, and the forest dweller and the herder have the means to adapt to climate change. It can ensure that poor rural people whose lives and livelihoods depend on the Earth's productive capacity have the means to produce more than to produce and to produce it better. But in order for it to move from the lab to the field, it needs to respond to the local environment and it must be supported by enabling policies that link research products and markets. Research into applications that benefit both the public and private sectors can foster partnerships that are essential in building sound, si sound science societies. In conclusion, agricultural research is fundamental for agricultural growth. But agriculture by itself alone is not just food security. Agriculture provides jobs, it creates employment. Agriculture, when properly administered, results in better health and well-fed children. When children are well-fed, they will stay in school. It enhances education. Their cognitive ability is much better. But agriculture even goes beyond that. It empowers women and creates empowerment and equality in society. It helps to create cohesive rural populations, which is fundamental for nationhood. In short, agriculture, it goes beyond food security. It ties all the MDGs together because it ensures food security, national security, and global peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Nwanzi, for highlighting the importance of agriculture, not only to provide food, but a lot more dimensions than this. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Jeffrey McNeely. And we are honored to introduce Mr. Jeffrey McNeely as an international, uh, internationally uh, involved actually since uh, 1968 with activities missions across 85 countries. Stan McLeely has written and edited over 40 books and he published over 500 scientific and technical articles. He served on the editorial board of 12 journals 
And currently, he is white professor at, at large at Cornell University. And he is chairing many institutions. Actually, he holds a degree in anthropology from the University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA. And more recently, he the formal co-founder of Eco Agricultural Partners and its founding president. I'd like to join me to welcome uh, Professor Jeffrey McNeely. Okay, so we've just heard, I think, just um, about everything we need to know about the rural landscape. So I thought I would talk to you about cities. Um, and how do we green our cities? I think you all recognize this place. Um, this is where you live. And the, the point of cities is that they're really based on human infrastructure, things that people build. When we build them, it takes labor, it takes capital, it takes energy, it takes a lot of inputs, it needs to be maintained. Um, if it isn't maintained, it starts to deteriorate. So that's human infrastructure. And if we think about the changing demographics of our planet, we've, we've heard a lot at this meeting about growing population. But about the same time that we reached 7 billion people, we also reached about 50% of the population living in cities. And if you look at this um, graph and looking at the, at the projections into the year 2030, it looks like the rural population is just about stable, not going to grow. Most of the growth is going to be in the cities. So that gives us a, a lot of motivation to try to figure out how are we going to ensure that our cities are green, that our cities are going to be sustainable. If we look at urban metabolism, you know, thinking of a city as an organism, it has the, the inputs of food, energy, and goods. Those are what make the human habitats. And then as the outputs, there's organic waste, emissions, and inorganic waste. And all of those lead to pollution, all kinds of problems that you're well familiar with. Well, let's compare that with nature's infrastructure. Nature does this all by herself. There are no um, waste materials. Every input comes from somebody else's output. Every output is used for an input by something else. The, the metabolism of nature is a sustainable one by definition. So if we think about this as a model for cities, perhaps we can try to make our cities or design our cities so that they have a more circular metabolism so that we take the renewable inputs and we recycle them. We recycle the inorganic waste, the organic waste, so that the outputs are a lot less. And this, um, the, the hope is at least, that this will make our cities more sustainable. I'd also like to emphasize the dependence of cities on nature. And so very briefly, I'd like to, to just make five points about water, food, energy, the quality of life, and inspiration. So, and very briefly, I'll cover these. Water supplies. About a third of the largest cities of the world get most of their, their water from protected areas. Um, I lived for three years in Indonesia near the city of Bogor, which is kind of almost in the middle. But Jakarta, which is further north, receives most of its water from two national parks, which are the dark green spots that you can see, which is Gunung Gede Pangrango and um, Haluan. Those protected areas provide the water that enables Jakarta to function. Without the protected areas, there would be no, not enough water for Jakarta. New York City needs a lot of water. They were going to build a water filtration plant to take water from the Hudson River and clean it up before people could drink it. But then they found that if they bought the watershed of, of the mountain, the Catskill Mountains, if they bought a big section of the watershed for about $1.5 billion, 
they could avoid building the water filtration plant that would have cost up to $8 billion. And the way that things work these days, that probably would have gotten a lot more expensive as they went through the process. And then it would have cost at least $300 million a year for the annual running costs. This was a, a significant financial saving, uh, economic saving, for the uh, city of New York and safe nature. And it gave people a, a wonderful place to visit on the weekends. If we look at Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, it has a national park and three other parks within its boundaries, and 14 more in the surrounding areas. These provide the water that enables Rio to, to continue to hold um, massive events every few years, including the Olympics coming up. Curitiba, another city in Brazil, has very purposefully left its rivers alone. The rivers go right through, the river goes right through the middle of the city, but they've moved the city back from the river so that when it floods, it has a natural flood plain. And if you see those little black dots out on the, the grass there in the peninsula, those are, um, that's wildlife. Those are capybaras, the world's largest rodent, and they live naturally in the middle of the city. And we can also see the, the ways that that wastewater is being recycled. This is just a small system. There are many much larger systems that are recycling water in many cities around the world so that they don't need to depend on new supplies of water but recycle it, much like nature does. Then what about food? As, as you can expect, the people in cities eat a lot. Um, maybe they eat seven, you know, people estimate they eat as much as 70% of, of the world's um, food production. But cities already produce 20% of the world's food within city boundaries. This is a, a picture taken at night of Amsterdam, and those yellow spots are not wheat fields. Those are the lights from greenhouses showing how much of the landscape of Amsterdam is being used to produce food for the, the people of Amsterdam and surrounding cities. They even export um, food from these greenhouses. But looking farther into the future, there's, there are proposals to make um, tower farms as much as 30 stories high. And these can produce uh, much, more, much more crops than the same area of land. And by doing that, reduce the demand for rural land reduce the, the pressure on the, the rural um, land and enable it to be used in a, in a more um, ecologically efficient way. You might think, well, hey, this is never going to happen. I'm sorry. It's already happened. There are already places in the world where food is being grown indoors using hydroponics with, with, um, with the water being recycled, with evapotranspiration, not losing water to the air, but being recycled, nutrients being channeled through the, the water. Uh, so this is a, something that is happening at a small scale, could easily be scaled up if we want to make our cities green. Then what about energy? Uh, as you can well imagine, just looking here at Alexandria, energy is incredibly important to cities. And in fact, you could even argue that cities are based on oil. If you look at the size of, of cities back in the year about, say, like, let's say 1840, when, when oil was first discovered as a, as a um, useful product, and the growth of cities since then, and the dependence now on oil, is, is a very intimate dependence. But we also know, know that oil is becoming more expensive. There's a, uh, the trouble that people are going to to find it, it deep in the oceans, up in the, up in the Arctic. The prices of oil are likely to continue to increase. So is this the uh, non-petroleum future? Or perhaps we can find um, a, a more reasonable way. <coughs> Solar power is already working could easily be expanded. And wind power is beginning to blow. 
There are other sources of, of energy that, that can be developed for, for cities, uh, but these are just a, a few of the examples. But to, to look at, at maybe the, the best example is to reduce the amount of energy that people use. So this is a domestic power meter made by Google where each household can watch the, what happens to their use of energy. And the, the psychologists have found that if you have the, the, the people who live in a neighborhood competing with their neighbors to see who can lose, use the least energy, the amount of energy they use all goes down. So here's a, a way of, of providing information to influence behavior. Then what about the quality of life? Well, here's Central Park in New York, and you can imagine the value of this real estate in Manhattan, um, hundreds of billions of dollars. But also, those buildings along the, um, the, the streets that um, run around Central Park, that's the most expensive real estate um, in Manhattan. So quality of life, people are willing to pay for it. Beijing is a green city. Uh, you might think Beijing, uh, all those billions of people, or actually millions of people, but actually they have more trees than they do people. And urban trees store carbon, they clean the air, they even lower the temperature on the sidewalk and the pavements by up to 10 degrees. So a lot of, of advantages, those are just some of them, um, that come from planting trees in cities. Some cities are working to provide wilderness. So Chicago, massive city, you've probably all heard of it. It's uh, kind of at the bottom of Lake Michigan there, not the bottom of the lake, but um, right where it curves down towards Indiana. But surrounding it are a whole series of different kinds of protected areas. Some of them owned by uh, the federal government, some by regional governments, some by local governments, and some even private areas, but managed together as a network of wilderness. Some of the people who were living next to these wilderness areas were very skeptical about this. They didn't like the idea. But once it was established, their real estate values also went up and their quality of life went up. Now the last one is inspiration. Grassy roofs are becoming more popular. You see these in, in many parts of the world. People can go up at lunchtime and, and sit on the grass and take their shoes off and feel the grass between their toes. That's one kind of inspiration. There's another kind that I would like to um, talk to you about for just a second. Uh, look at this. This is a city for insects, for actually for one kind of insect, termites. So in, in Africa, termites build these huge mounds. At the external temperature may be 40 degrees during the day and freezing at night. But the temperature within the termite mound stays the same. People have observed this. And if you look at, at traditional architecture in um, hot areas, this is Iran, they followed the same principles to make the, the temperature within those buildings comfortable. When it's hot or when it's cold, the, the temperature is more or less constant. And I have no doubt that the pharaohs had this figured out here in Egypt as well. Um, more modern in Harare, in, in uh, Zimbabwe, the Eastgate Center has been designed following the same principles. And if you go inside the, the building, it doesn't need air conditioning when it's hot. It doesn't need heating when it's cold. It's able to maintain a temperature um, through this biomimicry. In London, the Swiss Re, a big insurance company, built this huge tower built following the same principles. So they pay very little for air conditioning, very little for heating. They have a, an equitable temperature throughout the year because of following the design of those that was inspired by the termites. Ecologically certified timber adds value to properties in at least some countries. Honeycomb housing, 
built on the, the, the principles that bees have used in, in designing their, their beehives. When we f follow this kind of, of inspiration, we can come up with housing that is also much more energy efficient. Then one more example, lotus. Now you all know about lotus ponds with the beautiful flowers and the, the leaves, and you'll notice that they're never dirty. And why is that? Well, if you, if you look at, the, at what happens when it rains, is that the lotus leaf is, is washed clean. And in the, in the center here is an electron microscope uh, view of this. And if the surface of that leaf is a little bit rough, and so the water never makes close contact with the leaf. So somebody had a good idea. Let's try to mimic this with paint. And so lotus on there, the paint your house with this. When it rains, your house gets washed or your office building. And this is actually being used now. Um, where I live in Thailand, uh, we use this in our own um, balcony. And it never gets dirty. It's always clean whenever it rains. So is a, a future with, with um, biomorphic architecture, is this feasible? Well, it's already here. In England, Project Eden in Cornwall um, is built exactly following nature's principles. A uh, very sustainable uh, building. Pine cones open or close when they're exposed to mo moisture. People have, have used the same idea to make the kind of, of textiles for, for example, the couch that you see here, uh, that, that will, when people sit on it and moisture is produced, that it opens up and it becomes more comfortable. So lots of things that can happen. But people now, the urban planners, are taking all of these ideas and actually applying them. So in Abu Dhabi, I was there a couple of weeks ago, it, Mazdar is being designed to be a green and sustainable city, well on its way to doing that. India is in the midst of planning a new city called Oroville and designed to be a sustainable city. And you can see by the shape of it that it is inspired also by nature. So how are we going to green our cities? Well, here are just a few um, suggestions drawing from what I've been saying. First is that we should mimic the circular metabolism of nature. We've got to make sure that the water supplies are sustainable. Don't uh, steal it from anywhere else. Uh, produce food within the city. Energy efficient buildings is um, also a, a very important climate change or climate mitigation um, measure. Plant trees as an integral part of urban planning. Promote resource efficient behavior among the public in various, with various incentives and um, the psychologists know well how to do this. And then encourage urban people to visit nature. People like to get out of the city, they like to see nature, and they get inspired by nature. And I think that if we take these kinds of steps and think about greening our city, it's going to make the cities more sustainable, the people who live in cities a lot happier, and will put a smile on the face of nature. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McNeely, for your thought-provoking presentation. And we really need, need to uh, make use of uh, such uh, excellent ideas to uh, improve the quality of life in our urban areas. Uh, our third presentation, uh, actually, all of us here in Egypt know the word Sikkim. And uh, Sikkim will start it to stand for a series of food products, but went on uh, as a foundation since its uh, uh, start and inception 1977 by Ibrahim Ablaish, and then went on to develop into a number of institutions and school, but all the time green, all the time nature friendly. And uh, it's a privilege to uh, give the opportunity to uh, Mr. Helmi Ablaish 
to uh, talk more about this very inspiring experience of Sikkim, Mr. Helmer Blaish. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Yusri. Thank you, Dr. Ismail, and the whole team from the library for organizing this event and for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity to present to you a model of rural development. Opposite to what we just heard, I will focus on the rural development part, not greening cities, but greening the desert. And this is exactly what my father, Ibrahim Abulesh had in mind 1977 when he decided to come back to Egypt to develop uh, a rural development model called SECAM. But what were the challenges he envisioned then in 1977? Mo most of them actually are still the challenges Egypt is facing today. The population growth, growth issue which we have heard several times today in Egypt, in the region, Food security, which is linked to population growth, of course. Extreme poverty of people in cities and in rural areas. The quality of education to help them to move out of poverty. But also the quality of health services. And as we have heard just now, climate change. It's a challenge Egypt is not yet aware of, but where most of you will know that Egypt is the second most impacted country in the world of climate change. I think it's time that we wake up and understand that we have to move and do something against climate change. For this beautiful city of Alexandria and the library, it's, I think, a question of survival, that the sea level does not rise to two, three, four meters above the current level. And then the most urgent, water scarcity. And I think Water scarcity is an issue where many of us in people, people in Egypt were not used to think about as a challenge. I don't know whether all of us know that water is already today a, a very scarce resource in Egypt. We are living below the level of poverty, of water poverty, at about 700 cubic meters per, per head per year. And whereas every one of us here in the room needs about 3,000 liters of water every day to eat, we need about 1,000 cubic meters of water per year. So having only 700 cubic meters means that we have to import water and food. A huge challenge. And it will increase when we are 100 or 110 or 120 million people in the next 20 years to come. So, what can be done on the rural development side to tackle all these challenges? Let me give you first two pictures. One of the desert, piece of desert where my father started in 1977, eastern desert between Cairo and Ismailia. The first house was built in 1979 in the desert. Today, this house is in the middle of a garden a small oasis where we have a lot of biodiversity, plants, production, and people living. And the first fields, which we started to reclaim from the desert, down on the left you have a picture of 1987 where we started on a particular field, and you can see it again in 2009, 20 years later, where it produces a lot of food. So many of you can say, okay, land reclamation, desert land reclamation is not something very special. It's done all over the world and it's done in Egypt, in many places, by other organizations, by other communities. What is special about SECAM? I think this, the, the, the thing which is very special about how this land was transformed, how this community was built, how this rural development initiative was started, is the vision. My father started it with 1977. It was a vision based on a holistic approach to sustainable development. Holistic meaning 
that it tackles economic issues, including responsible and ethical business. So he wanted to prove that he can re reclaim desert without the use of chemicals, pesticides, in an organic way. But he was wanted also to prove that food can be produced and distributed and consumed in a way that the farmer and everyone in the supply chain gets a fair part of the added value. Social solidarity, today it's called fair trade, was from the very beginning part of his, of his vision. But he also intended from the very beginning to invest into the cultural dimension of sustainable development. The cultural di dimension meaning investing into people, investing into schooling, training, education, research. And of course also in the social dimension, building a learning living community, a community where people work together and produce more than everyone alone can produce. And all this in harmony with nature and all the natural kingdoms. And we have heard from, my, from the pre, previous speakers that yes, we had a green revolution, but we had huge impact on the environmental balance. Because in the green revolution, we have not built in the concept of harmony with nature. So how can we stay in harmony with all the natural kingdoms, with water, plants, animals, the soil, the air, energy, and so on? This was the idea my father had in 1977. And he succeeded to put it into place and into work. And the question is, how did he achieve this? And this is what I want to go through with you very quickly. What has been achieved? First of all, about 20,000 acres of desert land have been reclaimed in an organic way, without chemicals, without pesticides, and they are organic certified. 2,000 people work in SACEM today from the farming to the final product distribution site. 400 smallholding farmers in our region and all over Egypt produce organic products for SACEM and for others. They are all organic certified. They all have a fair trade certification and they all receive a dignified income which enables them to live a dignified life. We have been able to sequester in our soils in the desert through organic farming and composting one million tons of CO2 in our soils. Hence, we are really competing climate change. And we could prove that on our fields in the desert we use 20 to 40 percent less water by area than our conventional neighbors. And whereas water, as I said, is one of the biggest problems of Egypt today and in the future, using less water for agriculture, where 80 percent of the agriculture of all the water of Egypt goes, I think is a major achievement. We can prove that we have continuously increasing yields in our fields in the desert. And our costs every year go down. And we have been able to contribute to reduce the pesticide usage all over Egypt, nearly 90% when in the year 1991, in a joint project with the Ministry of Agriculture, we stopped aeroplane spraying of cotton all over Egypt. So there were a lot of achievements, and I would like to go with you through the different dimensions to show you how could these achievements be uh, brought to earth in Egypt. Let me speak about something which uh, is in our terminology in SECAM called eco-intensification. Yes, we are organic farmers. We do not use chemicals and pesticides. But we believe that we have to use our fields with a very, uh, we have to optimize all of our resources. 
and optimize our agricultural system. So we invest in the irrigation technology. We invest into wastewater treatment and reuse and recycle of all the wastewater of our own community and factories. We invest into pest control with new biocontrol measurements and into reducing the CO2 emissions through continuous ground covers and agroforestry. We invest obviously in composting and all biofertilizer technologies to substitute chemical fertilizers. So, as you can see on this field, for example, where we since several years make trials to compare subsurface and drip irrigation systems on the same crops, we could prove up till now in the last two years a reduced, a reduction of water in subsurface irrigation between 20 to 40 percent according to crop and year and time of the year. In our own bio wastewater treatment plants, we reuse all the gray and black water of our community and use it again for forest cultivation. And in our own uh, um, plants for producing compost, compost tea, and compost extracts, we produce enough uh, biological fertilizers to supply all of our 20,000 acres with enough nutrients to have high, the highest possible yields. And uh, just recently we started a new project to produce predators, beneficial insects, and microorganisms uh, to combat pests and diseases in our fields. Now, all this is the agricultural part. Uh, and you may ask, would this agricultural part be enough for rural development, sustainable rural development? Of course not. I think without including, as we also heard from my pre-speakers, the whole supply chain, without involving consumers, factories, traders, and make sure that our organic raw materials reach our end consumer with an acceptable competitive price and quality, we would not have succeeded in SECAM. Today we have 2,000 people working. We produce foodstuff under the brand of Isis and organic uh, textiles, pharmaceutical products. We sell to the local market and to all the global major markets, the United States, Europe, Japan and others, organic certified products. And we are globally competitive. But only because we had this transparency in the supply chain, we have a fair trade certification, and we have partners all over the world working with us in a tight cooperation. But again, this would not have not been enough if we would not have invested into our community, into our people. And uh, today, there are more than 1,800 beneficiaries of the different schools, education centers, our kindergarten, the medical center, the vocational training center, a community school, a school for children with special needs, an adult education center, who benefit from our cultural uh, institutions, our educational institutions. We have also the Heliopolis Academy for Research and Training working on our uh, research projects and this year we will open the Heliopolis University for Sustainable Development to work on all the dimensions of sustainable development uh, with students. So without all this, which could be considered an investment, SECIM would not be where it is today. But is it enough? Not yet. At the same time, we had to build a community. We had to build a learning living organization. We had to invest into people, not only in Seiken, but also in the villages around, to make sure that we have self-motivated people who give their best and are happy and have the feeling that they decide about their own future. We have established for them the Seiken Cooperative for employees, fair trade cooperatives. They are doing a lot of uh, 
activities in the rural area, in our desert area. We have chorals, orchestras, theatre groups, we have a sporting club and many, many activities. So that people, especially the young people of our area, uh, like to stay there and have alternatives to only working in the fields. So I think this is also a very, very important dimension of rural development. We have to provide some alternatives to the work in the field only for these young people. And to give you a glimpse of what we aim for in the future, in 2008 we launched our first project to multiplicate the example of Sekem into a new desert area. In 2008 we started on the Sinai uh, um, and as you can see it was a very wild desert area where we started in with the first trees in 2008 and only 18 months later through compost, through agriculture, through our people a new community has been established where today some 200 people are living and where we produce organic food for the local market and for exports. 18 months. So miracles are possible. And the same we did in 2010 in Minya in Upper Egypt where we started in an 18 kilometer long valley and uh, as you can see only one and a half years later today we produce medicinal herbs. We have more than 160 people working and living there and a small community is created of people coming from Cairo and from other cities all over Egypt. So I think Rural development is possible. I think that rural development will be an alternative to urban development. And I hope and envision a future where people from the cities will go back to the rural areas to benefit from rural development initiatives. But then we have still two questions to answer. I know that these two questions I'm always asked. One is if the world would follow such a rural development uh, initiative. Could the world be fed? Could all the world eat organic? Could we produce enough food? And would it be cheap so that the poor people can eat organic food? The answer is clear. There are more than enough scientific studies done in the world which prove that organic agriculture can better than conventional agriculture feed the world today, tomorrow, and when we are 9 billion people. So there is no doubt about this. Still, it remains the question, what about the higher price of organic products? So we did a study over the last two years in Egypt, and we studied how the prices of the major food providers of Egypt would look like over the next 10 to 20 years having in mind that energy prices will go up, that there will be sooner or later a carbon tax, a water tax, that uh, inputs will need to increase in conventional farming and the cost of the inputs in conventional, in conventional farming will go up. And what we have found out is, and we have done this study together with universities in Egypt and in, in Holland, that within the next 10 years, for most of the, the six most important crops, which, fee, which are about 65% of Egypt's food, the prices of organic products will be cheaper than of conventional products, 100%. So you can see here potatoes, for example, and it's very clear that organic potatoes within the next two or three years will be cheaper than conventional potatoes. The same is for wheat in the year 2017, and the same goes for rice in the year 2016. The same goes for mice, for sugar, the same goes for lentils and beans. The same goes even for cotton. So what I want to say and what I really hope for is that this sustainable uh, development built on organic farming, which I envision as the future for rural development all over the world will be and will be accepted as the only way forward for 
for Egypt and all the other countries in the region. And we should never forget that it all starts with the human development part. It all starts with investing into people, into our future generations, and enabling this future generation to establish a new future for Egypt, for all its countries, built on sustainable development and built on organic agriculture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Henry Abulhaish, for your inspiring presentation. And we uh, still have about 10 minutes or so for questions or inquiries. <coughs> questions? Yes, please. Yeah, I, I hope so. <laughs> I hope I understood right. Should I answer immediately, Dr. Esu, or should we gather some questions? Oh, yes, please, go ahead. I mean, the biggest obstacle at the beginning, 35 years ago and today, uh, is to find, uh, and to, to find the right people, to educate uh, our farmers, to educate our farmers in the right way, to find scientists who have knowledge about the topics, when we started, we were the first organic product project in Africa, in the Arab world, everywhere. So we had nobody to count on. Uh, today, we have a whole group of scientists in Egypt. We have supporters from many countries in the world and in Africa. And I think it's much, much easier, as you could have seen from our last uh, slides. Today, we could achieve in two years what we took previously 20 or 30 years to achieve in our first farm. So I think uh, we still face the same challenge. We need good people, we need good knowledge, we need research, we need uh, dedicated people, passionate people. But uh, we have a better situation than 35 years ago. And uh, I think we can uh, do much, much better when the Heliopolis University will start and open its doors, because then we will also have graduates, postgraduates, professors in Egypt to educate others in the topic. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, it works. Uh, my name is Amir. Uh, I work as a project manager in Sustainable Development Unit in uh, IMC, uh, Industrial Modernization Center. And my question is about uh, the concept of uh, clusters development, as I was in India three years ago, studying uh, clusters development for two months. And this concept is already uh, exist in Egypt, but maybe still the efforts to uh, focus on this uh, concept is not much uh, as it should be yet. Uh, so uh, my question is uh, uh, the concept of clusters development uh, what is the, the link to uh, urban and rural uh, development and how uh, it can help uh, to reach uh, sustainable uh, development. And thank you. Thank you. Um. Professor McNeil, would you? Uh... Clusters development, clusters, clusters. The question is about cluster development. I think I, I, I can only speak now for the rural development. And in, the, in the rural development, we have these clusters in a natural way. We have the villages, we have the people who combined with their combined knowledge produce agricultural products with all the different uh, uh, jobs. 
But I believe that the concept of cluster development for trade, for industries, for handicrafts is a very valuable uh, uh, tool to, uh, to optimize uh, efficiency and productivity. And uh, I agree with you 100%. I, I think it would be a great tool to introduce to, to all different uh, uh, development challenges we have in Egypt. But for agriculture, it's mostly already there. My name is Lamia Hayat. I'm a biochemist from Kuwait, Kuwait University. Uh, my, I will address my question to the whole panel whether they agree uh, with me because I didn't see, I didn't hear from any uh, that they should uh, not stress building dams as a source of electricity because, uh, I mean, when Sad Al Ali, when it is built, it was needed, but it deprived the silt that works as nutrient and the crop in Egypt is being affected. Uh, the, and also, uh, the dams that's been built in, in Turkey and uh, Syria and Iraq on Euphrates and Tigris, and then uh, that silt, it used to come to the marshes, now that the marshes is being dried, and all the dust is coming to our area, and uh, uh, the nutrient is not coming to the, shore, the upper shores where the estuaries and the you know, fisheries of the Gulf is there. So I think, uh, do you agree with me that dams are not, should not be, uh, that somebody should stress that dams they, no more should be built because uh, in the first place, as uh, Dr. Makar, Neil, he said that uh, uh, they are not necessary if there is any other way, uh, especially now that we, we can uh, do it with solar energy. building dams. The, uh, the World Commission on Dams has uh, produced a, a report um, maybe six or eight years ago now that really went into to details and looked carefully at, at um, dams and the World Bank provided funding for that but then when the report was finally produced they refused it uh, which meant it was a real good report. Um, the government of China, which is building a lot of dams, the Yangtze River has 40,000 dams in the Yangtze Basin. They also did not accept it, but they translated it into Chinese, which means that they want people to read it, even though they wouldn't accept that they should stop building dams. Um, I think it's going to be difficult with, with all the demands for irrigation water, for um, hydroelectricity, despite all these problems that we know about, um, the, the balance of power is still with power, um, not with conservation. And I say that as a conservationist and a, a sad conservationist. Yes. Uh, my name is Professor Savannah, Asri, Professor of Clinical Biochemistry and Immunology. Uh, I will ask uh, Professor uh, Dr. Abulaish uh, that uh, uh, how come that you can control the water resources for your projects, especially in Sinai? That's the first question. And for the, uh, the wheat, for instance, you haven't mentioned anything. In fact, uh, when I was in the International Conference of Biotechnology in Italy uh, last year, uh, I found that uh, there is a, a new plant uh, which is called the cassava. They have an excellent experience with Malaysia, and uh, it takes a very minute amount of water, and it can be cultured in desert. And it's um, instead of having the wheat and the water uh, consumption uh, is high. So um, I mainly I use your uh, organic products, even the eggs, which you <laughs> still and the honey. But uh, you, I think that we have to think for the future. Uh, in, uh, in view of the water lacking, what do you think about that? Thank you. Yeah, as I said, I agree 100% that we have to think about the water uh, challenge in Egypt, uh, and I can tell you that we have the same water sources than our neighbors. If it's on the Sinai, we have 
the Nile water which is pumped there. If it's on our mother farm in, uh, in Sharia, then it's well water which is, which is fed by the underground Nile and the same in Minya. Uh, and if it's in Wahat al Bahareya, where we also have a farm, then it's from the aquifers there, the old Nubian aquifer. So in all cases, the different sources are the same than our other neighbors have. Our advantage and what we are striving for is how can we optimize the water consumption? How can we use less water? Now, an organic soil having organic matter, organic carbon, millions, billions of microorganisms, a living soil, and technology like subsurface irrigation or drip irrigation or any other technology, together, combined, can save a lot of water. If you use the same technology in conventional farming and in organic farming, organic farms will use less water because the water holding capacity in an organic soil is much better. So you use, lose less to evaporation or to leakage. So this is the one message. So we have a solution as good as it gets for the water scarcity in Egypt. For wheat, of course, the, the issue is different. We need to have mechanization. We need to have a crop rotation. We need to have good, clean compost. We need to have all the good agricultural techniques which every good farmer is having. We have to weed and so on and so on. So there is no difference between us and our neighbors. The only difference is we would not use Roundup or any chemical uh, herbicide. So I think this is a big advantage for the environment, for the ecosystem. And it's maybe a little bit more expensive at the moment, but it will not be more expensive in the future. So new plants, yes, we work every day with uh, Jatrova, Jojoba, Moringa, Kazava, you name it, and we are testing them. We have R&D fields, and we are trying all the time to find out what, f what crops could we use. And we found that there are crops in Egypt, Vitex, Atriplex, and others, where you can use seawater to produce food for cows or brackish water to produce food uh, for, for animals and so on. So there's a lot of potential in research, I agree, and we should continue in research. I do not agree on gene manipulation and green bi biotechnology, but uh, I think it's not because I'm against them as an ideology, because I think we don't need them at the moment to solve our problems. I, I cannot hear you at the moment. Uh, as I have seen in your organizations, which is fantastic, and uh, I, I think that uh, thinking of having a, a station for water desalination uh, will be a uh, good idea. What do you think about that? Uh, to take the, the water of the sea and uh, desalinate and use for culture instead of the Nile water or the underground, which will, will disappear within 30 years. Thanks. Unfortunately, desalination, all technologies I know about, at the moment cannot produce a cubic meter of water for less than 40 US dollar cent. And this, is, this would make any product produced by desalinated water very, very expensive. So it's not a visible economic solution at the moment. And I hope that our researchers and technologists will find one in the future, but I cannot use it at the moment. We have tested it and we have uh, we have our own plant and, and so on, so it's too expensive. Yeah, good, good, good evening. My name is Jagdish Mitro from Bangalore, India. Uh, as the world is getting more and more affluent, at least in some regions of the world, uh, people are able to afford uh, you know, more and more uh, money towards food expenses, particularly the meat-relevant expenses, animal meat-relevant expenses. And we know that to have uh, any animal meat on your dining table takes a lot more energy whether it's water, air, as well as uh, lots of uh, feed. And how do we, is there a conscious effort, you know, in, on a larger scale for people to sort of turn away from the animal diet? I'm not questioning anyone's preference of the diet. It's just a general comment, more from the scientific uh, side. Is there a conscious effort moving away from animal diet towards vegetarian diet in such a way that we consume less energy uh, in this world? Uh, are these plans integrated into any of your uh, you know, uh, roadmaps, uh, you know, uh, any, any of the speakers can address this question. Thank you. Could you say, I think here are the experts for this question. 
uh, wh whether there are conscious, conscious efforts by institutions like my institution, uh, I will say no. Um, first and foremost, essentially, because I'll, I'll be specific to my institution. Uh, we are either fortunate or unfortunate to be working with populations that will not be described to as being more affluent, who will spend more money buying uh, meat, meat, meat diets, uh, I mean, feeding themselves on meat diets. But your point is correct. We know it costs a lot more uh, in terms of biomass to produce one kilogram of animal, animal uh, produce. Um, I think seven to eight kilograms of grain for one kilogram of pork, and about five kilograms for one kilogram of, uh, of, of beef or vice versa. Uh, the point here is, is that how can you do it more e e e e e efficiently and effectively? Now, in some of the, as you said, more, more advanced economies, uh, most of their animals is, 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 is reared on grain. Uh, in parts of Latin America where, there's, where, 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 where they produce very high quality uh, animal produce, it's, 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 on, it's on range. So it depends on exactly what you're, what you're talking about. There are movements, of course, there are movements, NGOs, who, who are, 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 are canvassing for, for, less, for less meat diets. That's, that's a different issue. Um, but at my institution, and for most of the institutions I know, we do not, we do, we do not per se uh, engage in, in the promotion of, of whether people are eating more animal or more vegetable diets. Final question. Firstly, I'd, I'd like to welcome to you. To, uh, I really appreciate your presence here. And uh, uh, my question for Dr. Helmi. In, uh, in your talk, you uh, mentioned to establishing a uh, research academy in Egypt, uh, will Sikkim use the biotechnology in research and development? Yes. Yes, we use biotechnology, yes. Okay, second question, please. Uh, can can a, a organic agriculture helping a, a country that you, uh, depending on developing country that depending on agriculture for certification? No, I didn't understand. I, sorry, I didn't understand the question. Organic agriculture techniques, can it help a country that depends on just agriculture for certifications for its... Can organic agriculture for countries that depend on agriculture, can organic agriculture uh, satisfy their... Yes, their yeah, this is what I wanted to say. I yeah. said that I believe that organic agriculture for a country which depends on agriculture and where many, many people live in agriculture can provide a better solution than not organic agriculture. We can employ more people, we can feed the population, and uh, we can save water uh, and other resources. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, let me just add, add a point here. because I think there's a lot of mis misconception on, 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 the, on, on organic agriculture as if it's a, it's a myth. Uh, basically, what we're talking about is very simple and practical. We'd, we're, we're working with about 500 million smallholder farmers. That's about 2.5 billion people today on earth who depend on agriculture for their livelihoods. And these are rural populations. They hardly can afford one kilogram of fertilizer. They hardly can afford one, one, one kilogram of highly improved hybrid seeds. They are growing their crops in conventional approaches, sometimes using animal manure. So in many ways, they are, in practical terms, growing their foods organically. Now, the point here, as, as he said earlier, we are not even optimizing the natural resources. You know, I mean, Africa, globally speaking, Africa has 60% of all uncultivated agricultural land. And if less than 5% is irrigated, and he's just shown what you could do. Subsurface irrigation or micro drips. We can optimize the water resources we have by just even using improved seeds of high yielding varieties. By better storage, we can reduce 30% of food loss by better storage. So in essence, what he's saying is so practical. And biotechnology is just a tool. It's not an end in itself. And we must also understand that I think oftentimes people talk about biotechnology as everything is GMO, it's transgenics. 
but they are simple molecular scientific tools that can generate improved crops without even going to uh, the, the high end of biotech. So the thing, what we're talking about here is how can you optimize the resources that are available to smallholders in rural areas? Well, thank you very much. I think we are coming to the close of uh, this session. So at the end, I'd like to uh, thank very much our presenters, uh, presenters uh, Mr. McNeely, uh, Mr. Nwanzi, and Mr. Abulaish. Thank you very much for your kind attendance. Thank you. Thank you.